Good morning and welcome to FIRST. We invite you to worship along with us through song, prayer, giving, and opening God's Word. Before we begin, I have a few announcements to make. Church family, save the date for our night of prayer on August 20th at 5 p.m. This is one of our favorite events of the year because we get to gather with all of you and lift up prayers for our church ministries, our community, and our nation. Night of prayer takes place in Ellis Hall. Mark your calendars for August 20th at 5 p.m. More details to come. Our famously hot city is certainly a cause to stay indoors, but it's not an excuse to skip your workout. To beat the heat, try the East Up Family Life Center. It's the perfect indoor workout solution to get you out of the sun and accomplishing all of your exercise goals. In addition to fitness rooms, an indoor track, and a full-size basketball court, the EFLC has weekly classes and activities to give you the custom workout you deserve. With plenty of options throughout the week, you are sure to find something that will work with your schedule. Check it out by visiting ColumbiaFitnessClub.com. Yesterday, a group of our high school students left on a mission trip to Detroit. For the rest of the week, they will be helping Refuge Church with backyard Bible clubs, service projects, and supporting the members of Refuge Church as they continue to reach out into the community with the gospel. Please pray for them as they are on mission for Jesus, that God will use this experience to grow them in their own faith and that he would use them in a mighty way to advance his kingdom. Are you new or visiting with us? We're so glad you're here and we are here to help you take your next steps and answer your questions. After the service, please stop by the connection desk to fill out a connect card. We have a special gift just for you. If you want to know more about following Jesus, getting baptized, or becoming a member, don't leave today without speaking with someone. Staff members will be in the parlor, which is just off the foyer following the service. Stay in the know about everything happening at FIRST by signing up for the weekly e-newsletter. Sign up at fbccola.com. Now, church family, let's worship together.
that's good news this morning. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and we can count on him. Turn to someone and say, I'm so glad to see you this morning. so much you may be seated and we will continue to worship now through baptism good morning church once again we have the distinct joy of witnessing a public profession of faith in Jesus Christ this is my friend Bradford Hendersman he's the 10 year old son of Jim and Candy and Jim and Candy had the distinct privilege and wonderful joy of leading Bradford to a faith in Christ Bradford this is your first opportunity to tell others you trust him I have a question for you have you decided to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes, sir. Because of your profession of faith, it is my honor and privilege to baptize you, my little brother, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. <clears throat> Father God, we praise your name. We honor your name today that you have reached in to this earth and changed the life of one young man. Father, may his witness go forth and bring others to your side. Give him all the courage and ability to do just that. Father, send us your spirit today. Let us worship you wholly in these things we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. It's so good to see you at First Baptist Church, and my family is glad to be back from vacation, and I hope that y'all had a wonderful time last week with Richard, and um, it's always a pleasure for him to fill the pulpit and um, make a few jokes at my expense, and so I hope you enjoyed that. A uh, few things I want to tell you. First of all, we have these beautiful flowers, and they've been given by Ellen and Don Boylston and Stella Donnellan to the glory of God and in loving memory of their sweet parents, Stella and Bill Crumpton. We also have a few anniversaries, and 57 years ago, two couples in our church were married on the same day, although I don't think they knew each other, Gary and Judy Greger. Today, celebrate their 57th wedding anniversary, and we are say congratulations to you. And at the same time, worshiping with us by television, Jim and Sadie Hartman celebrating their 57th wedding anniversary today. So, happy anniversary to y'all. And one last couple, Freddie and Libby Sock, celebrate their 61st wedding anniversary on July 21st. So, congratulations to the Sox family. Well, I, uh, coming off of vacation, sometimes it's nice to uh, not have to prepare a sermon the day before. So, I am grateful that Bryant and Ann Wright are here this morning. Uh, Bryant uh, was the founding pastor and pastored for 38 years the Johnson Ferry Baptist Church in Georgia. And uh, currently, he is serving as the president of Send Relief. And um, we are so thrilled that they're going to be here and that Bryant is going to preach for us this morning. Um, not only that, uh, Bryant uh, took it upon himself to um, pour into new pastors, young pastors. And uh, I was a, uh, just, it was a pleasure for me to be a part of a group of a few other pastors with Bryant for a couple of years uh, there at the beginning of my pastorate. And I'm so thankful for he and for Ann, and I'm looking forward to hearing him as he shares God's word with us this morning. Now, if you're visiting with us today, we're so glad that you're here and you're our honored guest and we would love to get to know you and help you get connected here at the church. You can uh, stop by the connection desk or you can tear off the bottom portion of the uh, bulletin, drop that in one of the offering boxes around the sanctuary, or you can visit online and uh, on our website and you can fill out a connection card there. But I'm so thrilled that you're here and uh, we're going to continue to worship now together.
Father, we come to you in all thankfulness and praise because you are worthy. During this time, please use your word now to teach us, strengthen, discipline, encourage, and sustain us. We acknowledge that your word needs to impact our daily lives. And now we offer to you our worship and our tithes. May they bring you honor. Please bless and multiply. For it is in the precious name of Jesus we ask. Amen.
Thank you, Steve and choir, and thank you so much, Wes, for the opportunity to be here in the pulpit of First Baptist Columbia. And thank you for the opportunity to share a word about sin relief. After pastoring for 38 years, now serving in a new role, and I realize a lot of you may not be familiar with it, so Wes has allowed me just to share a brief word about what this is. Sin Relief is in the business of seeing needs being met as God is changing lives. And our mission is to serve churches like yours and churches all over the world as you carry out Christ's Great Commission and do this through ministries of compassion. There are five major focuses of Sin Relief. One is strengthening communities where we deal with a lot of global hunger issues, especially in remote parts of the world and sub-Saharan Africa right now. It is hard to describe not only the drought that is taking place in some areas, but because of the Ukrainian war, the lack of food. It is a devastating scene there. We're seeking to meet needs through churches and through our IMB missionaries there. Secondly is ministry to refugees, and the largest undertaking we have had in our ministry in the three and a half short years of the ministry is the Ukrainian refugees. And there have been literally millions, mostly women and children, that have come to Eastern European churches where we're seeking to minister through those churches. Because you see, we believe that the long-term ministry of the local church is where the greatest impact is going to have. So we're providing resources for those ministries to take place. Third is ministry to children and families. And we're very thankful that Roe versus Wade was overruled by the Supreme Court, and that's going to save millions of lives. And yet we now know in American culture, in many places, children that were unwanted in the womb are now going to become unwanted outside the womb. And the need for churches to take on a bigger role in foster care and adoption in the years ahead is a service that Sin Relief is seeking to provide. Fourth is battling human trafficking, probably the greatest, worst evil in our world today. And it is very labor intensive as these young girls have been trapped in really a modern form of sex slavery. And we have two centers in Vegas and New Orleans domestically and then seeking to minister, especially in India and Thailand in that regard. And then disaster relief. Right now in Vermont, they've had incredible floods. There are about 10 state disaster relief teams that have come there to Vermont. Sadly, a lot of those small churches that we seek to minister to, they have no flood insurance. And so they're gonna need teams like First Baptist Columbia to come and help them in the days ahead or to support them. You see, one of the beautiful things about Sin Relief is because all of us are either IMB or North American Mission Board personnel, all our salaries, all our operating costs are provided through your mission dollars. And 100% of all the funds that go to Sin Relief go directly to ministry. That's very unusual in a ministry that's able to serve in compassion and relief. I want to thank First Baptist. Y'all have been a key supporter, not only of global missions through our denomination, but of Sin Relief. We also have serve tours where we gather churches together. Our next one will be in Chicago, gathering as many churches together as possible to love on the city through service projects over a weekend to show the love of Jesus Christ. We have catalogs available for you as you leave today to pick up and where you can give gifts to children around the world, special needs, and you'll read about in that catalog. But if you want to know more about Sin Relief, just go to our website at sinrelief.org. And remember this, something I'm continually reminding our staff of, whether it's our global staff or our domestic staff. We can meet real needs to help people feel better on their journey to hell and miss the greatest need, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are first and foremost a gospel-centered ministry. And so thank you, First Baptist, for your support. Standing here is a real privilege. There's a lot of memories here in this place in Columbia. I was born here across the street. I don't remember that experience. But I do remember where I met my wife, Ann, here through the college ministry 50 years ago this summer. So there's a lot of good memories in being here at First Baptist. I was serving as your summer intern with your students here and 
Ann and I met, fell quickly in love. And next year, I think we're going to make 50 years of marriage. I saw 57 for a couple of your couples today. We're really young people compared to them, but that's quite a long time and a lot has changed. So with those kind of memories, I want to ask you to turn in your Bible, if you will, to Genesis 2. If you're new to Bible study, this is an easy passage to find. Just go to page one and then turn over to page two. You'll have it. We're going to go back to the very beginning on marriage. Now, your pastor, Wes, has been taking you through a study of Proverbs, and he's covered the first eight chapters. He'll be taking you to chapter nine when he returns next week. But today we're taking a break in that study to look at the very beginning of God's plans for marriage. And I want to read in verses 18 through 25 of Genesis chapter 2. And then I ask you to go ahead and find one other verse in the book of Judges. If you can find Joshua in the Old Covenant, the next book is Judges. And just go ahead and put your finger there at Judges chapter 17. But we're going to begin by reading Genesis 2, verse 18, and to honor God in the reading of His Word. If you're physically able, will you stand now for the reading of God's Word? Genesis 2, verse 18. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was his name. The man gave names to all the cattle and the birds of the sky and every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And he slept. And then he took one of his ribs and he closed, closed up the flesh at that place. And the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. And then Judges 17 Verse 6, at a time of difficulty in the life of Israel. In those days, there was no king in Israel, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. Father, please speak. As we go back to the origin of marriage and what you had in mind when you invented this great institution, We pray that you'll speak, Father. And as we look in your old covenant, may we always seek to understand your word through the mind and the heart of Jesus Christ. For it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. It's a long time to stand through the message. In June of 2015, when the Supreme Court issued its Obergefell ruling legalizing same-sex marriage, it was really a tipping point in American history when it comes to the sexual revolution. For you see, when guys like me of the baby boomer generation came along and really had our maturing years in the late 60s and early 70s, there was being thrust on American culture what was called the sexual revolution. And for the first time, it was no longer kind of winked at that men would have this double standard of engaging in premarital sex till they were married, but women not. No, in the sexual revolution, it was the advocate that both men and women engage in premarital sex. There was an overwhelming acceptance in the late 60s and early 70s of no-fault divorce, ending your marriage for whatever reason that you felt was appropriate. As the sexual revolution moved on, then the advocacy for homosexuality being accepted became a part of the culture in which we live in. And yet, not near to the degree of what happened as the LGBT movement became not only an advocate, but demanding that all affirm not only homosexual behavior, but same-sex marriage. And so, 
when in 2015 the Supreme Court made its ruling, it really was a tipping point in cultural change of acceptance. Because don't forget, when President Obama first ran for president in 2008, he ran on the platform of upholding traditional marriage. Now think how radically different things have become in contemporary American culture just in that very short period of time. But it was really a tipping point of what had been building for 50 years with the sexual revolution. And so in that light, let's go back to the beginning and let's see what God had in mind. And I ask you this question. Are you willing to consider the inventor of marriage and what he has in mind when it comes to this very high and sacred calling in life? Now to do that, I want us to begin in Genesis 1. This will be an easier passage, page 1 of Scripture to look at. And let's look at one verse, verse 7, because this is a key background. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created him. Now, a couple of things about man in God's creative process. Number one, we are in his image. That means we are like God. We are not God, but we are like God. What does that mean? That means we have creative abilities. We have the ability to think and reason. We have the ability to enjoy language and communication that is different from the animal kingdom. But not only that, man has a moral conscience. Now, people are going to vary on what is right and wrong, but man has a moral conscience. A lot of people today say, you know, we live in a day and age where people have no sense of morality, no sense of values. That is a completely untrue statement. Man, from every walk of life, is passionate about his values. It's just we live in a day and age where each person is seeking to do what is right in their own eyes versus God's. And because of that, you're going to come to some very different conclusions of what is right and wrong. But man in the image of God has a moral conscience like God, even though it can be terribly misguided. But not only that, man has been created in the image of God as male and female. Men and women are equal before God. Now there are different roles in the home, there are different roles in the life of the church, but they are equal before God. And God has just made two sexes, male and female. Now I realize in the trans movement that is so intense in our day and age that we're dealing with today, that there are people who feel by mutilating their body, and sadly there are many in medical science and in government who really endorse people mutilating their body to seek to change their sex, but even when mutilation occurs, the person is still either male or female. No matter how they look, that cannot be changed because that is how God has created us. And you may be struggling with some of those issues now. I'm so glad you're here today in church. You may be joining us by TV or video, and I'm so glad you're here. But I urge you, will you be willing to trust what God has chosen for you when it comes to your sex rather than doing what you feel is right in your own eyes? This is really a key foundation in looking at God's calling of marriage because we go back to Genesis 2 verse 18 and we see God says this, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone, and I will make him a helper suitable for him. Now, God has been saying everything about His creation is good. This is the first time God says something that He has done is not good. And that was the aloneness of Adam. He was missing something. And God was looking to make a helpmeet suitable for him. And the word suitable means to complement. Someone who is corresponding to. Someone who is like but a bit different. And so we see that God is eager to meet this need as he sees that Adam is struggling in his aloneness. Even though Adam lives in the perfect paradise, he's got the perfect job. Everything is in harmony with all the animals. There's no killing of animals. There's no killing of animals killing animals. Everything is in harmony at this point in history. But God realizes Adam is missing something. There's an aloneness. He needs someone that is a compliment, someone that is corresponding to him. 
Because you see, the animals can help, but they just don't quite meet the need. Look at what he says in verses 19 and 20. He said, look, he brought about all these animals to Adam, and Adam was to name the animals. The names he gave them, that was their name. But at the end of verse 20, it says, but for Adam there was not found a helper suitable for him. Now, I realize some of you are great pet lovers. You love your dogs, your cats, your fish, your birds, whatever it may be. I, I realize you, you, there's some of you really love pets, and some people love pets more than people. They really do. Some do. But I know this. My wife loves her dogs. Ann's sitting right here. She's going to admit to it. She loves the dogs we've had. And when our first dog died, Ann cried for three days. We got about 21 sympathy cards from people in the church. It was really amazing how people identify with losing a pet. She cried for three days. Finally, I said, honey, if I died, would you cry this much? She said, don't ask me that question. <laughs> well, I had the answer. She said, but that dog never talked back to me. That dog never questioned anything I did. And for some reason, because people are a little harder to deal with, it's easy to be a pet lover and see how meaningful that is. But the conversation is kind of limited with your dog. It's kind of limited with your cats. You can say, well, they understand me. Yes, they may, but the conversation back is a bit limited. And that was the case for Adam. You see, he was glad to have all those animals. There was no such thing as wild animals. There was no sin. All the animals were in harmony. They weren't afraid of man. But there was something missing. So look at what God does in verse 21. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs, and he closed up the flesh at that place. And the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man, and brought her to the man. Now, I want you to look at God's role here in the very first marriage. First of all, he's the first anesthesiologist. He puts Adam to sleep. Secondly, he's the first surgeon. He performs surgery. He takes out a rib and he fashions it. It literally builds it into a woman. So we see that God is also the first master artist. I mean, to take from a rib and to bring out a beautiful woman, that, that's an incredible master artist. In 1501, when Michelangelo was commissioned to take that giant block of marble and bring something good out of it. It said of Michelangelo that many days he would just go look at that block of marble and he would just study it. He did nothing. But what he was envisioning with his great creative powers was eventually that 17 foot high statue of David that is incredible. You go to Florence today, you see that statue, you're just amazed at the accuracy compared to the human body. But that statue is not alive. As incredible as the creative power of an artist like Michelangelo is, it is not even close to the creative power of God who has made you and all of creation. And here God as the master artist makes Eve, this woman. And then we see God serves as the first matchmaker. He brings them together. And I realize for many years in American culture, we did away with matchmakers, but now we have matchmakers, the computer. That's the main matchmaker in our culture today. Many of you came together because of your understanding of how you could find a mate through that internet matchmaking system. But God is always the best matchmaker in finding the ideal mate for anyone, and so He is also the first father of the bride. And in a sense, this is an ancient version of him walking this beautiful woman down the aisle to see Adam. And how did Adam respond? Well, look at verse 23. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. In other words, he begins to recite Hebrew poetry. He didn't know it was Hebrew then. But he begins to recite poetry and talking about how this is what I've been looking for. This is somebody like me and yet She's a little bit different from me, and that little bit of difference makes all the difference in the world. This is great. This is what I was longing for, and I didn't even know it. And so Adam is thrilled at what God has done as the perfect matchmaker to bring him this bride. And then God gives guidance when it comes to marriage. Now, 
verse 24 of Genesis 2 is a vitally important verse because it is not only given to us through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to Moses here in Genesis 2, 24, but Jesus recites this verse. When Jesus was asked about divorce, he begins to talk about the calling of marriage. And he recites this very verse in Genesis 2, 24. And then when the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 5 gives us the clearest teaching on Christian marriage, he too recites this verse in Ephesians 5, 31. So I ask you this question. If Moses and Jesus and Paul are led by the Spirit of God to include this insight on three keys for marriage, I think we need to listen to it. I think it's pretty important. What does God's Word say about marriage? For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now, what's the first key? The first key is for the man to leave his father and his mother. Now, what does that mean? It's not talking about the man stopping loving his mom or dad. It's talking about the man having an emotional break in that kind of priority relationship and being sure that his wife is the person that he is closest to over any other human relationship on the face of the earth. In other words, it is a calling to be best friends. Remember, God was concerned about Adam because he was alone and thus the great need that Adam had was the need for perfect companionship. And certainly all of us have our lives blessed when we have friends. And here in marriage, the spouse is to be our best friend. Now listen, are you listening? If there is anybody on the face of the earth that you're closer to than your spouse if you are married, you need to repent today and get that right. You say, well, I've got men. I've got my men's group and I'm really close. I really open up. If you're closer to them than your wife, your priorities are out of whack. Or, or women say, well, I've got my women friends that, you know, we share about everything. No, if you're closer to them and sharing more with them than you are with your husband, you've got things out of whack. The person we're to be the closest to on the face of the earth over mom or dad, over any child that we have, is to be our spouse, to be best friends. That's what God has in mind, that emotional attachment to the person that He has called us to marry. But then He says this, and be joined to His wife. Now the word for join is the word of total commitment. In other words, in marriage, we don't get married with the idea when we were coming along in the late 60s and 70s, uh, there was this movie Love Story out and it just, you know, as hokey as the Dickens if you see it today. But, but anyway, they, they, there was new vows that people were making and sometimes they would make vows like, uh, as long as we both shall love in their wedding ceremony. Well, that's just a formula for divorce. Because in marriage, it is to be total commitment and divorce is not to be a consideration. Now, I realize many of you are divorced. I understand that. And sadly, some of you have felt rejected in the body of Christ because of your divorce. That's not how it's supposed to be. Divorce is never the will of God. He allows for it in certain sins that occur, but it's never what He desires. And yet divorce is not the unforgivable sin. It is a sin outside the will of God, but certainly the grace of God and the forgiveness of God can give you a cleansing and healing in God's forgiveness there. So, I know many of you are divorced, but it's never what God had in mind. We're just called to be sure that we seek God's forgiveness when we fall short there. But it's not just divorce when we think about this total commitment. We also see it in what has happened in American culture as another outgrowth of the sexual revolution when it comes to cohabitation. I read recently in the Pew Center poll, which is really the authoritative poll for moral issues and religious issues in American life, and in that most recent poll, they found that 90, are you listening? 90% of all Americans approve of cohabitation. 90%. That means 90% of all Americans approve of premarital sex, which is the sexual immorality that is clearly a sin against God. But here's what's even more striking as we are worshiping in a Bible-believing church today. They also found that 53% of evangelical Christians are now living together before they're married. That could be some of you. 
And I'm so glad you're here today. But you want to understand, you have a big question to deal with. Are you willing to trust God's plans or seek to do what is right in your own eyes? If you're cohabiting, could it be that God is saying to you today, it's time to get married? If you're cohabiting, could it be that God is saying today, you know, we've got to stop this. If I'm going to be serious about my witness and claiming to be a follower of Jesus. Some of you that are into cohabiting or even fine with your children cohabiting have strong opinions about the sin of homosexuality. While all the while being blind to your own sin. Sin is sin before God, and we're called to trust God in His way versus doing things our way or what is right in our own eyes, which is the embodiment of sin. That's what sin is. So are you willing to trust that when God says marriage is not just to be to someone who is your best friend and continues to be your best friend, but one that you're totally committed to? Are you willing? But he says something else in this verse, a third part of healthy marriage, and that is the two shall become one flesh. Now, even though there's clear guidance in Scripture when it comes to sexual morality and sexual immorality, God is the inventor of sex, folks. Don't forget that. Sex is God's idea. He's invented it. It is a good blessing, but a good blessing only in the context of committed love between one man and one woman. You see, God has made us as male and female. And one of the reasons that sex is so good is because God has commanded man to procreate. So for procreation, for the multiplication of human life, that's one aspect of sex. But it's also a gift for mutual pleasure for the husband and wife. And both the husband and wife are to be committed to maximizing that mutual pleasure with one another as a wonderful symbolic act of the love that God has blessed you with. It is a good thing. And yet we've talked about many alternatives already in the message this morning of how the culture thinks it is best when it comes to sex. But God's best is one man, one woman for life, as best friends, totally committed to one another. And out of that kind of relationship comes the one flesh relationship that God desires for the husband and wife to enjoy to the fullest. It is good. And any other approach to sex is seeking to do what we feel is right in our own eyes. So since God invented marriage and sex, don't you think it's best to trust the inventor with how you live? Then he goes on, verse 25, and the man and his wife were both buck naked and were not ashamed. I've got a picture of two elderly church ladies sitting on a park bench and evidently the pastor has used the term buck naked in a sermon or something and she turns to the lady beside her and said, is it buck naked naked, or is it butt naked? Well, in the South it's buck naked. And they were not ashamed because this is good. This is wonderful. Now, I admit at this point because there's been no sin, Adam and Eve were perfect tens. So it's a little easier not to be ashamed in any way. I understand that. But with sin, as man begins to die, comes sags and wrinkles and things that are not quite as pretty. But when Adam and Eve were brought together, they were buck naked and not ashamed because God says this is good. Now, thinking about this simple plan that God has for marriage... And thinking about where we are today 
And where we have come in the last 50 years in the sexual revolution and the confusion and the decadence and really the madness that has occurred in contemporary culture, we want to understand why this has come about. Well, that's why Judges 17.6 is so important. You see, all throughout the book of Judges, the children of Israel would fall away from God and they would begin to do their own thing. And God would bring judgment on them by allowing a pagan nation to come and discipline the children of Israel. And then they would cry out to God to save them, cry out to God to forgive them, and He would. And then He would send them a deliverer, a judge, who would lead them to the place they needed to be once again. And then the pattern repeats itself over and over again. They fall away from God after He blesses them. And what you see in Judges 17, 6, and what you see in the last chapter in Judges 21 of that book, it says the same verse twice. In those days in Israel they had no king, and each person was doing what they felt was right in their own eyes. Men and women, teenagers, boys and girls, if there is any picture of America today, it is Judges 17, 6. People feel passionate about the values they believe in. But whose values? Is it God's values? Or is it what you feel is right? You see, in the end, it's really a decision who's going to be your king. And here's what I propose to you today is the solution. Have Jesus as your king. Now understand this. If Jesus is your king, it means a willingness to submit to Him and His will that is found in the teaching of His Word under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. That's what it means to have Jesus as king. Otherwise, we're going to have self as king, and we're going to choose to do what we feel is right in our own eyes. And it is incredible at the rationalizations and the explanations that man has for doing what is right in our own eyes. But when Jesus is king, then we're empowered by the Holy Spirit and guided by the teaching of the Word to live in a way that is pleasing to God. And that is true for marriage. It takes us all the way back to the very beginning for God's plan for marriage. And all of us are imperfect and we will fall short. But we begin to be on the road to living out what God had in mind. Are you willing? What is your decision? Who will be your king? Will it be Jesus or you? But here's the key. Now listen, are you listening? Jesus will never be your king until He becomes your Savior. Because you see, our sin that wants to do what is right in our own eyes finds us separated from God and dealing with all kinds of negative consequences in broken relationships, in disillusionment, in disappointment, and all the brokenness of this world and life. But God in His love for us has sent His Son Jesus to give His life for us on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin. We have sung about it this morning. We've remembered it in worship today. The God of the universe with all these sins that we've talked about today, He loves you so much that He sent His Son to pay the penalty for all those sins on the cross so that when you and I confess our sin and are willing to repent of our sin, that is to change our mind about our way of thinking in a way that we're willing to follow God. And say, Lord, I need you to save me. I need you to forgive me. He does. He makes us right with Him. And then there's the bonus. Christ rose from the dead. And we get to conquer sin and death because Jesus did on the cross and with the empty tomb. But there's another bonus. God gives us the Holy Spirit when we come to Christ. And the Holy Spirit living within us, God's Spirit living within us, gives us an inner want to to trust that God, our Creator, knows what is best for all of us. 
And then the Holy Spirit empowers us through the teaching of the Word of God to live in a way that is pleasing to God. And then we begin to realize that as God has set these guidelines, He does it because He loves us and knows how life for us can be best. So question, who is going to be your king? Jesus or yourself? I promise you, if you choose for Jesus to be your Savior and your King, and you're willing to live in a way that is pleasing to Him, you will know that what God has planned for marriage and all of life is really for the best. Let's pray. Father God, as we've looked at your plans for marriage and we've touched a lot of nerves today, whether it's divorce, or premarital sex, or cohabitation, or homosexuality, or same-sex marriage, or transgender issues, or whatever it may be, we realize a lot of ways that man gets confused when man decides to do what we feel is best. But Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit, I pray right now that a lot of folks may be struggling in some of these areas or struggling in other areas. We'll just come to you and say, Lord, forgive me. I really have been very conscious of my values, but they've been my values and not yours. And I now want to trust you, Lord. I need you to save me. I need you to transform me. I need you to change me. I need you to come into my heart and life so that I'll have the strength and the want to to submit to Jesus as my King and follow you. Lord, in every life here today, may that be the decision that we are sure we are making or have made or recommitting to today. May we trust you and submit to you as our King. And we pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus is speaking to many of you, and you may have a decision to make. Maybe you want to find out about joining the church or following a believer's baptism. Or it might be that you want to get help in uh, certain areas of your life or ask some questions or get connected to a small group. I would invite you to make that decision today. As we conclude our service on your way out the doors, if you just stop by the connection desk, they'll make sure you make it to the right place uh, so you can meet with church staff or volunteers who would love to help you as you make a decision for Christ today. Well, I'm so thankful that uh, Bryant came and uh, was able to deliver such a wonderful message. And uh, Bryant, uh, not only does he have roots here at First Baptist Church, but he is also a wonderful University of South Carolina Gamecock fan. And uh, I hear he was a, (laughs) they, they like you for that. They like you for that. I hear he was a wonderful cheerleader there on the sidelines uh, while he was a student at Carolina. And so we're glad to have him here and share a message. And I know many of you will be interested to find out about Sindri Leaf. And we have um, uh, participated, uh, over the, as a matter of fact, this year with the crisis uh, in Turkey, the uh, earthquake uh, in Syria. 
And uh, we, we sent, uh, uh, sent a lot of support to what they were doing there. And then last year with the Ukraine, uh, the struggle there and the refugee situation, uh, you at First Baptist Church, that your gifts uh, were able to support that. But you might want to find out more. They do have some of those catalogs that he mentioned that will be back at the connection desk on your way out. You can stop and pick those up. But uh, right now I want to invite you to stand. And uh, I'm going to offer a prayer. And uh, then we will sing as we are dismissed. Dear Jesus, we are so thankful that you are a great king. Lord, I pray for every person with the sound of my voice that they would allow you to be king of their lives, king over every decision, king over every critical matter. And Father, may you save because we know that only you can save from the uttermost. And so we pray that you would do that today. It's in Jesus' name I pray. joining us this morning for worship. We hope you'll join us again next Sunday as we open God's word, lift his name in praise, and pray together. Have a great week.